to the Peace Offering Podcast. In today's interview, we have Dr. Richard Olry, who has been a chiropractor for 40 years based in Michigan. And point on that journey in his chiropractic journey, he became very focused on minerals. And um, he has now he's now pretty much exclusively working with hair tissue mineral analysis, looking at people's tissue levels of minerals, helping them remediate specific minerals that he thinks are 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 crucial for optimum health and gut health. He also works with local farmers to help them remediate their soil for these necessary minerals. He's testing soil, uh, which is like a whole nother level of healthcare practitioner that's looking at how we get the minerals into the food and it's coming from the soil. Rich has numerous books out, including Minerals, Hair in the Human Genome, Metabolomic Handbook of Cerebral Spinal Fluid, Minerals for the Genetic Code, Minerals for Acupuncture Meridians, Minerals, Vitamins, and Food Supplements for uh, the Amish, who he's worked extensively with. Uh, Rich is really just a phenom in the mineral space. So I hope you enjoy this interview. Okay. Well, thank you, Rich, for coming on our program. Really appreciate you talking with us. I'm I'm actually really looking forward to this. And um, a good friend of our community, Dr. Glenn Ryan, uh, made the connection for me to you because he was saying that you have a, a long history of exploring minerals, uh, mineral remediation with regard to soil and farming, and that is a big topic for our upcoming conference. And um, also, I'm personally interested in in these minerals, and you seem to have highlighted um, a couple. But before we get into all that discussion, can you just give the audience, you know, a short couple minute intro to who you are and what you've been up to? Why, well, well, sure. Um, I've been practicing at the same location for 44 years in northern Michigan. I became interested in minerals at the age of four when my mother was fulfilling a prescription at that time. I picked up a book of rocks and she bought it for me and I still have it. And when I went through chiropractic school, nutrition was a focus. And in 1977, the Wayback Machine, I stumbled on a book called... Um, the Book of Light by Walter Russell and then Atomic Suicide. And in those books, they had a periodic table that included the name of all the subatomic particles. This man was way ahead of his time. So I, I've been working with the knowledge of subatomic particles. Um, so I wrote a book um, with Chuck Walters, the founder of Acres, called Acres USA. Uh, the book is called Minerals for the Genetic Code. And before he passed on, we wrote a second book called Minerals for Tumor Suppression. We never published that one because the farming industry is not in the doctor business, and I really didn't didn't push that one. So that got me launched way back in 2005. Uh, so I started attending Acres USA conferences where I would do speeches, and then I got invited all around the country to attend organic farming uh, gatherings, but I bring the doctor human side in. You have, um, they have found 44 minerals in the human brain, and I like to use hair tissue mineral analysis as a primary way of seeing what your brain has excreted in the past 90 days. And when I do that, there's trends. And the biggest trend I see is either poisoning or starvation. And there's a lot of bad minerals, a lot of bad actors out there. There's a lot of barium and aluminum and arsenic and the list goes on. And the minerals that we do need, there's so much problem with what's happened to the soil. Uh, you could take example of everybody's big, big favorite uh, around, if you understand what I mean. Uh, people don't you understand. That. Here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> the big round is uh, is an antibiotic. And they go, what? I go, yeah. It, when you spray it on a field, it kills bacteria so that your plants cannot absorb minerals. So we have so much empty harvest going on from the soil to the food chain. And sadly, the big roundup ends up in the seeds that the people make their breads with, uh, and it really causes disharmony in the human body because about 80% of your immunity is your gut bacteria. And when you start wiping out species, you start going into a state of starvation. And that's, to me, the, the link between healthy soil and healthy body is we need from the food the proper stuff to grow the right bacteria in our gut. 
And that's something that's hard for people to comprehend because they just don't think that 80% or 90% of the DNA of their body is not their body. It's the gut bacteria that we create by the food we eat. Let's see. That's kind of where, where we can go on this one. Yeah, great. So um, your interest in, in in the minerals found in the brain was, so l- let's go there, because I think that um, what's important is you mentioned a few of these sort of toxic minerals or metals, and um, what you would be seeing a lot with HTMA and, uh, analysis, and, and what were, are some of the deficiencies that you would see? Oh, they're right across the board. Um, when I get the hair test back, I can fold the paper over and then just draw a line down the page where it goes normal to below normal, and I start counting up all the different minerals that are deficient. And it's like, it's not that maybe you could be eating the best organic food, but if before you became organic, you lost a lot of your bacteria, that's a problem. So I'll, I'll just go a little bit on that gut bacteria. Our body needs to make hydrochloric acid. And that's so our stomach will kill off all the bacteria that's not supposed to be in the small and large intestine. Only bacteria that can live in that stomach acid are allowed to pass. But there is so many problems with people's stomach that they're not digesting, the belly gets full of the wrong bacteria. Um, So it's, it's just, it's amazing how bad most people's guts are. So if you could be eating good, but if you can't digest it, it's just passing through you. That's problematic. So I look for the four basic minerals that I think are needed for DNA to become RNA. And that RNA has to be able to make the proper three-dimensional structure protein are iodine, selenium, magnesium, and boron. And those are the far most four minerals that you could put into your body that keeps the whole DNA messenger RNA uh, uh, protein creation going. Now, it's estimated 80% of the population in the United States is iodine deficient. You only get enough iodine if you live within three miles of an ocean because you might breathe it. Two out of three people walking the earth are considered selenium deficient. Hence, you have the number one cause of death now being cancer. And with this COVID virus, that's really kicked things up something terrible. Magnesium, well, almost everybody I run into uh, is a magnesium deficient person because they're dehydrated. And what I mean by dehydrated is the water that comes out of a lot of taps isn't necessarily water. It's more like a slurry. So if, if somebody is looking at a hair test and I, and I want to know why they got such bad absorption, I'll type in the city of Detroit public drinking water and I'll look for the qual- water quality report and we'll find out that it's chloridated and fluoridated and aluminum sulfated. So water is not water until it's proven to be water. And so that causes people to lose their magnesium. And the last one is boron. Boron is like a B vitamin. It's water soluble. If you don't constantly put it in, you will not be able to retain a lot of it. It goes in, your body will use it, and then you get rid of it. And if you get into a boron deficiency, then you automatically will start losing all your magnesium out the kidneys, keeping you in a chronic magnesium deficiency, right? And for every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. When you lose the magnesium, if you're getting selenium, you will then lose the the selenium as well. And the iodine-selenium connection is your thyroid. If you don't have both of those minerals in your thyroid, your thyroid is not going to work right. And on a hormonal basis, since there's eight primary hormones, if you're lacking iodine and selenium, your hormone system's not going to be right because all the hormones revolve around the thyroid and the thyroid has to have selenium and iodine. And sitting right next to that thyroid is the parathyroids, and that's what regulates all of your boron. So these are like some of the most critical things that's got to go into the body to get any type of decent repair going on. Great. Um, so I think what would be useful is if we go one by one through some of these and talk a little bit more about them. You know, my my understanding of it, iodine, as you mentioned, is critical for making thyroid hormone. Uh, selenium also critical for making T3 out of T4 and in the diiodinase enzymes um, but also there are other there are other sort of uh, systems that utilize iodine that you could maybe elucidate for me i have heard but don't know 
that the gonads utilize quite a bit of iodine. And um, I'm also aware, you know, you're talking about this kind of toxic slurry that's in the water that the halogen group can have a major impact on the body's ability to absorb iodine since it's in that halogen group. Do you have you have thoughts on these things? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the halogen group has been expanded, and I'll explain what that means in a second. If you look at what the recommended daily allowance of iodine is, you know, that's basically saying you have to have this much so you don't take the big dirt nap. And the difference between minimum and optimum is dramatically, dramatically different. Um, the guru on iodine is Dr. David Brownstein, and he's like trying to get everybody to take 25 milligrams, not micrograms, but milligrams. So we do have a tremendous, tremendous need for iodine. And if you get low on iodine, the women get low on iodine, they get cyst in the breast, they get cyst in the ovaries. Uh, there's a lot of complications to having low iodine. And then you throw the fluoride in there, that just makes you fat, lazy, and stupid because it drives all the iodine out of your body. Uh, all the fabric in cars is bromated. Your, your new couches are bromated. The beds are bromated. So you're getting all these off gases. And all of these different minerals compete for the same binding site in the body as iodine. And that is not a good thing. Now, I'm going to throw in another mineral on the halogen side that I wouldn't bet anybody listening to this broadcast is even aware of. But everybody is aware 12 years ago, there was a, a catastrophic event in Japan called Fukushima, where these nuclear reactors, you know, got basically melted down. And there's 400 metric tons of salt water going into the ocean, as well as the, the stuff they're trying to clean up bleeds off something called tritium. And there's three forms of water. You've got H2O, hydrogen dioxide. D2O, deuterium dioxide, and tritium, which is tritium trioxide. Now, that mineral is actually a radioactive mineral, and all radioactive minerals have a half-life. And that half-life is 12 years. So what started going into the ocean last March hit the 12-year mark, and that tritium turns into something called helium-1. And helium-1 is a halogen that God did not put on Earth. A tiny bit comes out around volcanoes, and we get it when you see meteors coming into the environment. We have a meteor shower. Beyond that, it doesn't make it. So the entire atmosphere that we've lived in for 12 years has been saturated with tritium, and now it's breaking into helium-1. And helium-1, if you look at the book I wrote called Minerals for Acupuncture Meridians, Meridians is tied right into tyrosine, the amino acid metabolism, which is compounding the problem with the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So making sure you have a lot of iodine is a very good thing. Now, I'll be right up front, don't do what I do, but I'll tell you what, I take an eyedropper full of iodine every day to keep myself fully saturated with that halogen to keep slowly dumping all the other ones out of my system. I avoid fluoride toothpaste, and a lot of my customers, I say, well, do you floss your teeth? And they go, yes, I do. And I go, do you understand the FL in floss means fluoride, that you're coating your teeth with fluoride? And I said, just think about the days when TV commercials used to say, our toothpaste has fluoride. Fluoride kills the bacteria that causes tooth decay. Well, it's an antibiotic. And so I try to eliminate as many sources as fluoride as possible. I try to educate people about bromine in pops. It's, it, it used to be in Mountain Dew. It's in Ruby Red and a few others. So Got to get people educated to needing the iodine. Again, you got to have the selenium. And if two out of three people walk in the face of this earth with selenium deficient, where are you going to get it? Well, if it's not in the soil, it can't be in the broccoli you're growing. It can't be in any food you're eating if it's not in the soil. So I'll ask people, well, do you eat Brazil nuts? No. Do you eat chicken gizzards or turkey gizzards? No. What about sardines? And they say, no. I said, where are you getting your selenium? People don't know. So that's a real critical thing. And I look at that on the hair test as the third thing I look at. When I look at a hair test, my eyeballs are immediately looking at barium and aluminum because we got these airplanes that fly over us and they seem to be putting out some type of a white ash that falls on us. And it's quite notably high in barium and aluminum. If I don't see that barium and aluminum 
being at a certain level, that means what you're breathing isn't coming out of you and it's probably going in. Now, barium is the big brother of calcium and magnesium. And if the barium levels get too high, it really goofs up calcium and magnesium levels, especially on the hair test. But barium's nemesis is selenium, and the body hates barium so bad, it uses all the selenium to keep the barium moving out of you. And if you don't have the adequate selenium, you are, you've lost control of detoxification of all the minerals that have a plus two charge, cadmium, lead, mercury, beryllium, then it links up with folic acid to get arsenic and antimony. And the list goes on that you can't detoxify heavy metals without mighty selenium hooking up with glutathione. Yeah, I was just about to ask, is that because it's running that glutathione recycling system? Well, if you take a look at the 24 selenoproteins, a third of them are actually glutathione. I mean, it's glutathione directly attached to selenium. Glutathione perioxidase 1, 2, 3, 4. You got selenoprotein F, H, the, the, the list goes on and on. Now, the problem that I've run into since COVID started is it's simple. I don't need two pictures of a dog to know it's a dog. And I run across two articles that says the following minerals have been labeled dysfunctional because of the virus. The virus knocks out eight of the 24 selenoproteins and it knocks out glutathione synthetase. So if you take glutathione out of the picture and you take selenium out of the picture, you've lost control of the majority of the oxidative process of the body, which includes iron. And when you take glutathione out of the picture, you can't do anything with the heavy metals. And, and so now you have no way of decent detoxification. And I read another article that says that if you actually take some of the shots that they're offering, as the model detoxifies, as the body detoxifies the metals that they found in the shots, and the metals they found in the shots are not very impressive, that it causes the bacteria that processes selenium in your gut to die off. And that's a real big problem. And the name of those bacteria are the bifobacteria species. Right. Now, the metals right. that they stuck yeah. in the shots was aluminum, antimony, barium, cerium, cesium, chromium, cobalt, calcium, gadiolium, titanium, potassium, uh, silica, and sulfur. And I took a look at that and went, oh my goodness, some of those actually can cause blood clots. I like gadiolium, all you gotta do is look up gadiolium. It causes, it gets into your brain, it gives your brain clog. And if you don't have that selenium to detoxify all that stuff, your body gets into a world of hurt, inflammation. Okay. Okay. So uh, when it comes to sources and amounts uh, that you generally recommend, what, what are they? If um, do you get, I mean, are you asking people to get this from food or are you just kind of assuming that the soil that the food is grown in is deficient? And so uh, suggesting a different type of repletion, like a supplemental repletion. Well, let's just talk about iodine for a second. Dr. Paul Detloff was the head vet for Organic Valley. And him and I hooked up and he said, Richard, let's do a study on our girls, you know, the cows that are fed sea kelp, organic sea kelp, uh, mostly from Thorben and the American Kelp Company versus a conventional feedlot, you know, dairy cow. And we got eight samples of each. And when you compared the numbers, the hair of the cows that ate sea kelp was 5,400% higher than the conventional cows. The boron levels were 250% higher. So when you just look at what's in the soil it will make a tremendous difference. Now, unless you're putting a lot of sea kelp on your garden, where's that iodine coming from? It certainly isn't falling from the sky. Uh, so you have to have sources of iodine. Most people don't have the wherewithal to eat three or four meals a week from the ocean. Hence, you do have a need to supplement. And I live in Michigan. All of our soil is completely depleted of selenium. I only know a handful of organic farms that I would trust to eat out of because they have to put selenium into the rations for the cow because it gives them about an 18% more milk production. 
So I know the fertilizer that's going on the floor in the barn out to the field is the right kind of selenium that's been processed and it's biologically active. Those are the two key minerals that, that I really worry about a lot. Now, boron, I don't know many farmers that really think about boron, but the organic farmers do big time uh, because they want to have the best crops. So they have to actually apply boron with about once every five years because boron actually evaporates and it's water soluble, it runs off. So that's kind of problematic. Uh, looking at those key minerals. I mean, we could always talk about you know, trace minerals like zinc, copper, and all these other ones, but I really like to stick on the iodine, selenium, magnesium, and boron um, so much that 20 years ago, I developed a pill that has those four minerals and it. it's called the Grand Unified Mineral Complex. I'm selling about a lot of them. How's that? <laughs> okay, and what, what are the amounts that you think are, are good for a day? I have three milligrams of iodine. It's a mixture of kelp and potassium iodide because the potassium iodide is always good for radiation poisoning. And I like all the trace minerals found in kelp. Selenomethionine is the active form of selenium that you need. It don't matter what kind of selenium your body encounters, it's going to either convert it to selenomethionine. I just put it in so we don't have to waste the energy for the conversion because if you get too much of the wrong kind, it packs into the pancreas and will trigger type 2 diabetes, and we don't want that. And that would be 200 micrograms a day is what I'm recommending. Three milligrams of boron is an absolute bare minimum. And I've got, I think, 200 milligrams of magnesium in, in, the, in the Grand Unified, along with a little bit of vitamin D and C. And I had to throw some sulfur in there, so I put um, the taurine in there. Got it. Okay. Um that that's really interesting so let, I, let's dig in a little bit more to boron i i am aware of the relationship of boron to magnesium in its role in sort of regulating uh magnesium absorption and also um boron's role in i don't know exactly what the role is whenever i try to figure it out but it's got a role in uh sex hormone production as in regulation of sex hormone production. Um, are you aware of this? And it, could you help me like elucidate what the relationship is there a little bit better? Well, the most important thing I've learned about boron is it's the second most abundant mineral in the human brain. When I mean the brain, the brain is coated in cerebral spinal fluid. That stuff is made, it goes down and out all 64 nerves. It's completely replenished every eight hours. And to have that be the second most of the brain leaves me wondering why. And so I tried to answer that question, why? If you don't ask a good question, you don't ever get a good answer. If we take two simple minerals like calcium and boron, even though they both have a positive two, they charge each other opposingly. It's like putting two north magnets together, they repel. So in your heart, calcium contracts and magnesium relaxes. Potassium and sodium, they're plus ones. In a nerve, you push them together, you have a nerve impulse. Now we got two minerals, aluminum and boron, which are, you know, aluminum's everywhere. And I said to myself, why would God put boron as the second most abundant mineral in the brain? It's there to repel aluminum. We do not want aluminum crossing the meninges getting into the brain. So God set this up that that boron sitting there just constantly repelling it. Well, then Roundup comes along, and it causes what's called leaky gut, and the meninges start to leak at the same time your gut does, and the aluminum gets to go into cerebral spinal fluid and push out the boron. Just like calcium contracts, magnesium relaxes. Sodium contracts, potassium relaxes. Aluminum in the brain causes the meninges to contract. Now when you go into rapid eye movement, if you're so lucky to get it, you're not getting the brain washed out of all the biological byproducts. It can't clean itself out. And you're getting the beta amyloid building up and then it goes from a three-dimensional structure to a two-dimensional structure and it triggers you know, massive cascades of events. I like to start off there, but I'm a boron in relation to gut and soil health. How, how can you not link the two together when it's in literature? 
Now, the rest of the body, when it comes to it, the molecular targets of boron are very numerous. Uh, it goes after what's known as serine protease, particularly serine protease inhibitors. Think of boron as the brakes to overproduction of anything in the body. Now, right now, what we're looking at is we have a virus to grab a hold of the ACE2 receptor. And it's got to then link up with another one called the Tempris, which is like a two-part deal to attach, so it can take a hexagonal drill and throw the genetic material into the cell. The body is lacking the boron seri the boron, seri boron seriatus inhibitors to stop it. So the thinking is if we can saturate the body with boron quantum dots, we can fill the ACE receptors up so that the virus doesn't continue to cause reinfection. Once you get reinfected and you got this genetic material going through you, this virus appears to have some of the qualities of HIV, the amount of uh, viruses it can produce, is shutting down interferon uh, alpha, beta, and gamma, particularly the gamma. So your body doesn't identify this as a virus and it doesn't create the necessary protein sequences to try to break it down. It's just a big, long cascading list of events that occur. So we're looking at boron as going to be something that's going to uh, possibly be in the future to, to get this to uh, go away. Now, if you look at the actual cell in itself, within the cell, you have a mitochondria where all the energy is produced. And it has a, it, its job is to actually, boron's job is to actually drag fatty omega-3s into the mitochondria so that you could use these oils to help generate adenine triphosphate. So boron's play into this whole thing is so critical. Now, if you take selenium out of the picture because you're not being able to utilize selenium anymore, where is the selenium stored? It's stored in the testicles. It's stored in the thyroid. It's stored everywhere, but the biggest storage spot in the man is the testicles. And of course, men try to give it to women. So our biggest loss is a female's gain. Also, you have to have boron in this picture because you have something called ribose nucleic acid. And boron is distinctly tied up in the use of ribose. And where else do you make more cells anywhere in the body is the testicles for reproductive services. So this is this big link. If you don't got the boron, you ain't gonna make you know gonna make happy sperm cells. The tail and the head of every sperm cell is a selenium motor-driven tail, and the egg is looking for the receptor of the selenium. Once that selenium locks on, the tail has to be strong enough to push the sperm into the cell. Once it gets inside the cell, the cell knows what to do with it. It just rips it apart, moves it to each end, so that we have mitosis and meiosis take place for fertilization. And the reproductive stage. Does that answer your boron question? Yeah, it does. Um, it, it almost sounds like um, there's this constant sort of competition within uh, within the body for these different uh, mineral elements, and that and that it's really it's kind of a numbers game. The way that you describe it is whatever you are inputting more of is going to be sort of the winner. Is that is that how you look at it? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we can we can watch a TV where one person plays a piano and, and we that sounds beautiful. You could take a flute and maybe make a quartet and it sounds beautiful. But when you have an orchestra and you have all the different instruments, that's what the array of minerals is supposed to be, is like an orchestra all working in harmony with each other. Now, if you have a deficiency of one, it's going to gum up the process and how things are made. Then the body's got to set things in a set of priority to keep the heart beating, keep the legs working, and it might neglect a lot of things. And if you look, if you neglect selenium, you're going to get loaded up with viruses. This is one of the biggest problems with COVID right now is shut down all the selenol proteins. Now everybody is absolutely getting overrun with the Epstein Barr virus, the cytomegalovirus. Uh, you just name the virus that your body's used to sitting on, it can't sit on it anymore. So we're seeing diseases that are so rare, it's not funny, but now they're becoming commonplace because of what's going on with the virus in relation to selenium. So if you put the key minerals back in, get the basic core stuff working again, then when you start fine tuning your gut and you start pulling all the other minerals back into the play where the orchestra is making the music, then the heavy metals can come out 
and then you can get your deep sleep, you, you know, go to bed and wake up rested and have energy. They, they've all got to be in concert. Now, what I've learned about the minerals is I think it was Texas A&M put every mineral as a 100% pure mineral into an MRI machine, and they set the magnets at 100 to equal hydrogen, the most abundant mineral in the universe. And they found to a millionth of a megahertz where these things just kind of basically lifted off the plate and floated like there was a, a magnet pushing them up. Well, your DNA doesn't, your DNA understands this frequency. So a protein sequence made from DNA that becomes messenger RNA hooks onto the ribosome when it finishes the finished product in a three picoseconds, if you can imagine that, it turns into a three-dimensional structure. And within the system, within your W band, if you don't have these minerals, you can't create the proper three-dimensional structure. And if you don't make the three-dimensional structure, it gets put into the garbage can. And if you do it too much, the garbage can can break, such as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It's making the wrong bonding angle on the superoxide dimutase molecule. And the, the cell says, we'll make it again, keep making it till we get it right. We got to you know, work. Then so many cells get into the trash can, the trash can breaks, then the cells start dying. And people don't know they have ALS until so many brain cells have died that they start to have symptoms. And that's actually brought on, I'll just finish it, it's brought on because the body's not getting cadmium out of the astral sites in the brain. And the cadmium exerts its weak magnetic energy, forcing the bonding angle between copper and zinc, superoxide dimutase, to be the wrong bonding angle. So if we don't have an orchestra of minerals, this is why when I do a hair test, it's like, okay, you're not absorbing anything. We got to get the absorption right. Maybe you need a few minerals. But what I see more than anything is when we get healthy people, all the bad stuff starts coming out. And the biggest one is arsenic. Uh, everything east of the Mississippi, north of the Mason-Dixie line, you got to be wary of arsenic coming out of the ground. You get out west on the west coast, to the up and down the whole west coast, there's a ton of vanadium. And it just depends where you're at to what your geographical location will determine what possibly is in the groundwater. Uh, so if I get a whole family that's all got arsenic in it, first thing I do is I get that water tested for arsenic. And if it's in the water, I can say you can keep drinking, drinking it, but I can guarantee you, you're going to get kidney cancer and bladder cancer over a period of time. So I condemn a well until you get filtration. And I always tell people, water's not water till it's been tested to be water. And, and that's a really big issue. It's a horrible issue, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I forgot to um, thank you for that. I forgot to ask you this when you were talking about thyroid before. Um, I'm, I think I read Jerry Tennant uh, talking about, and I don't know if he got this from Brownstein or this was his own, his own thesis, which, uh, which is, you know, your thyroid will make thyroid hormone with or without iodine. It, it could make it with other halogens. Um, is this your view also? So like oh, testing. Absolutely. absolutely. So people coming in and they've got goiters. One eyeball starting to stick out and I'm going, man, you got a major thyroid. Well, they tested my thyroid stimulating hormone. They said nothing is wrong. I'm like, yeah, right. You're drinking fluoridated drinking water. You're using the dental flush. You're using the toothpaste, et cetera, et cetera. And I says, what they're testing for, you're saying that T3 is normal, but it's not normal because it's got the wrong size and the wrong shape. If you take a look at what frequency iodine oscillates at and compare it to fluoride, uh, fluoride oscillates at the highest number of any mineral on the periodic chart. When you plug that in, all the bonding angles on that molecule will change and the surface receptors are gonna be completely different. The body, they think it's there, but it's not. When you start putting people on iodine and pushing the fluoride and the chloride and the bromides either out or back into a decent position, uh, then you start to see people get better. Now, people that are really low on iodine never make enough stomach acids. This is why all these purple pills are on the market, flooding the market. If you look at the prescribing information on those pills, they're, they're for two weeks, and people come in taking them for 10 years, and they're wanting to know why they're degenerative, why they're sick, why they've got no energy, You know, basically why they're burning out their DNA code you know, years and years before they should be. And I'm 100% thinking that fluoride is the biggest offender. And now I'm taking a serious look at this helium one from the tritium degradation into helium 
from tritium to helium one. And if you just go to Google and type in helium levels are raising because when two helium one hit each other, it turns into conventional helium and the helium levels on earth are now going up. So that, that, that there's, there's some stuff you gotta put two and two together to see what's going on. So the, the best thing is to do is to start off with your iodine, just keep increasing it, increasing it, increasing it. And, and there is a lab out in Colorado that you can do a, a urinary test, a 24 hour iodine loading test. And then you can, for a little bit of extra money, you can get the fluoride, bromide and the chloride levels also sampled to see if you challenge yourself with a bunch of iodine, what ends up in the urine to see what your body saturation is. And, and that's always a good thing to do if there's ever any doubt. Because I don't trust the, the hair tissue mineral analysis for iodine levels. It's too reactive. It's, it's just, it's not a good mineral for the current machine where they're using. What's, what's the name of that lab in Colorado? Uh, the Hanaka, H-A-N-N-A-K-A. If you just type in something very similar to that, put iodine and put Colorado, that'll pull it up every time. It's like $70 for iodine and then $35 each for fluoride, chloride, and bromide. And I'm telling people to get it all at once and see if you're going to do it. Because you, Yeah, thank you yeah. for that. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with the Oligo scan? And um, if so, are is this, in your view, accurate? Is it a good proxy for HTMA? Um, I, I, I'm fully aware of that machine. Um, I have a, a philosophy. If I'm going to buy a computer, I want it to do what I want it to do it when I want it to do it. I don't want it have to be hooked to an internet. And I don't want somebody in Germany getting $55 every time I decide to use it. I want to use my computer. I want to use a computer. Have I looked at it? Yeah, I looked at it really good. A very dear friend of mine has one and she uses it extensively. Now, when I look at a hair test and I'm saying, look, you're pushing all your boron out. When you put your hand on the oligo stand, it says there isn't any boron. So you have to understand the relationship of when you're seeing a really high mineral, does that mean you're poisoned with magnesium or calcium? No, that means that the barium is probably pushing it out. You have an absorbent amount of boron coming out of you. You don't see any aluminum on the hair test. The aluminum is pushing it out. So when you use the oligo scan, you'll see like a severe boron deficiency and you're looking at the hair test you're looking at a ton of it now i deal with people everywhere and i can't mail an oligo scan to them i want to know what that brain's excreted the past three months that gives me that doesn't give okay this is to me i look at that as like an mri is like this is what the whole brain is versus a cat scan to me a cat scan is a polaroid picture and an mri is a vcr you're getting a lot more. So I'm looking at something that happened for three months where the oligogan is taking a picture of what's going on in your body at a given minute in time. Now, if you look at the book Minerals for the Genetic Code, I lay out every mineral is going to regenerate at a different hour. It's tied into all the acupuncture meridians. Nobody showed me a scan where they did it every hour and said every hour of the day, that scan is consistent. So if calcium regenerates at three in the morning, would I expect to see it to be different? Yeah, I would. I would expect to see because our DNA code works like this. Energy enters the body at four in the morning when our DNA code is at its most resting state. And then from four in the morning to four in the afternoon, it expands. And when iodine kicks into regeneration, the code starts collapsing down. So at no point of the day is our DNA code the same frequency. This provides for all the circadian cycles that we have in the human body. So any testing you're going to do, just ask an allergist. Well, we tested him at you know, 55 pokes on the back and he was allergic to uh, Coca-Cola. But we did it at four in the, you know, we do it at a different time of the day. Now he's allergic to his cat and his grandmother and everything else, because it does make a difference when you do the scan. So a hair test is a three month readout where the oligo scan it, it may be good. I don't use it in my office. I stay strictly with the hair because that's where I get the greatest amount of satisfaction over a period of time. Got it. One of the things I've been exploring quite a bit recently is iron metabolism and its regulation by copper and ceruloplasmin. 
uh, you know, uh, via the Morley Robbins work, if you're familiar with him. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you mentioned your four sort of key minerals that are in your supplement. And can you, um, could you maybe uh, connect the dots for me between uh, how those minerals that you are, that you are focused on interact with iron and copper? Oh, okay. Let's back up. How do you get iron and copper in the body? Through the action of cobalt, AKA vitamin B12. So cobalt brings it into the gut. And then once it's in your system, these minerals have charges. So for example, zinc, it uses B12 to get in, but it's a plus two mineral. Once it's in the system, all the plus two minerals, calcium, magnesium, sterontium, uh, zinc, iron, it, there's, of course, there's two forms of iron. These are under the control of selenium, keeping an eye on the oxidative process. So that, that is really important to understand. I'll look at a hair test and I'll see coppers off the roof and maybe selenium, is, I mean, the, the zinc is super low. I'm like, oh, I got to bring the copper down. I got to at least stop the loss of it. You put the selenium in, that stabilizes all the minerals that cobalt brings in, all those ultra trace minerals. Now, copper's got quite a bit of attention lately because a lot of copper on the market is a plus two, but in plants, it's plus one. So if your body makes superoxide dimutase with the plus two zinc and a plus two copper, it's going to have a different bonding angle than if copper was one. That's a really big critical thing. If you're getting like a copper, a plant-based copper molecule, like Dr. Ed Group makes from Global Healing, that's a plus one molecule. And you need to be utilizing plant-based copper because you're going to get much better results with copper. And if you don't have your copper and zinc in the right ratios, you start making all kinds of chemicals that, that turn you into a Charles Manson because that's these type of people all have their copper levels are through the roof. It's out of balance with zinc. It creates a bunch of chemicals in the brain and basically you lose reality there, what it amounts to. Now there are 24 selenium genes in the human brain. They only know what 16 of them are doing right now. And when you take out eight of the 24, the brain process really changes. There's a lot of information up there, but your body no longer can connect the dots have really good intelligent conversations and we're seeing a lot of that in the day of the COVID age where people aren't able to put stuff together. That's why it's really critical to get these key minerals back into everybody. Everybody's got to be remineralized in the current environment we live in. Now, so what was the other with copper and what well don't forget whenever you start talking iron. well iron iron to me what the COVID virus has done it shut down something called glutathione peroxidase number one. And that is the, the, the gene, the glutathione gene with selenium that regulates copper oxidation. And what's happening when you shut glutathione peroxidase number one down, it's like my truck. When it was brand new, it weighed 5,000 pounds. I'm running around a truck that weighs 7,000 pounds because it's picked up so much oxygen, we call it rust. People's bodies are going into a terrible state of rust, rusting because of the loss of glutathione peroxidase number one from the virus. And that's one of the most important aspects that this virus that I can see does, and it causes the iron doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So it puts cells into a premature apoptosis state, the state that the cells start committing suicide when they're not supposed to, because they go back to the big daddy. P53 regarding the genetic codes, ah, oh, can't be fixed, kill it, make another one. So this is causing the telomeres at the end of our chromosomes to prematurely burn out, and we're not able to replenish the, with telomerase. We're not able to regenerate the telomeres as fast as we're making the cells that are being broke down because of the iron changes in the body because the virus shut down glutathione peroxidase number one. Now, anybody with weak telomeres is going to perish before anybody else. This is why when the virus hit the scene, they got into the nursing homes and wiped them out. They're already fragile, hanging on to life with just a thread. And as soon as those telomeres quit regenerating because of the virus and the loss of selenium, 
this is what caused so many of the initial deaths was the was the telomere aspect of, of uh, relationship. Now you can link you can link a lot of things to the burning out of telomeres, but iron is a big one because of the glutathione peroxidase number one being disabled. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Uh, let's sidestep over to um, soil and. Yeah. Um, and and I'd love to hear your explanation for, you know, the 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 ecosystem of the soil, the the microbes that live in the soil, and have a big role in this sort of shuttling and processing of the minerals to get them into plants, and um, and, and I don't think enough people really are aware of not just that to have minerals in your body, they got to be in the food and to get them in the food, they got to be in the soil, but it's not just that simple. You can't have dead soil with minerals in it and expect the plants to, to have an adequate supply. So what, what is your understanding of this relationship between the microbiome of the soil and these minerals? Well, that's not hard to explain to me. If you have one mineral, okay, take magnesium, the energy of one mineral being magnesium will generate one type of bacteria. If you take two minerals, each of them having a, a very specific energy level, you'll get a two to the third power. When you take three, you'll get another to the third power. When you take all the minerals that say and found in sea kelp, you're talking about the potential of billions of different forms of uh, bacteria that's going to exist. Now, given the environment they're in, there's bacteria that live in the vents at the bottom of the ocean that's DNA based where the temperature is six to 700 degrees. And they're not even using sunlight for photosynthesis, they're using a form of sulfur, a DNA life form. So the bigger the plural of minerals you'll have will give you the best chances of creating the most diverse amount of bacteria. Because bacteria have to have something to eat and that's organic matter. In steps the herbicides, uh, that causes them to act as an antibiotic, killing off all the bacteria. Those bacteria that do live, because there has to be enough bacteria to grow your genetically modified plant, those bacteria will live in that environment. And then through the process of gene transfers, it'll transfer to all the weeds that you're trying not to get. And then the plants will pick up these traits. And then you'll have super plants that are now resistant to what you're trying to grow. And the food that you're eating is so full of the chemicals that it doesn't sustain life. Now, when they genetically modified all the plants, and I've done this, here's, you got a tomato that's got this amount of minerals. And then here is a GMO tomato, or at least a Roundup Ready tomato, and you look at the mineral content, you got a potassium loss, you got a magnesium loss, you've got a calcium loss, and it's all been substituted by sodium in order to keep the energy frequency at the depletion of everything, sodium goes sky high. This is why all the animals that are fed the GMO stuff, they don't live very long. They got to either get them chopped or you know, go feed McDonald's because the kidneys burn out. It's just horrible on the kidneys and the rest of the body because it's the, the exchange of energy to create life that's not balanced is to take one tuba player, you know, have 50 tuba players and only one flute player. It, it, it just screws up the harmony, something terrible. So if you don't have the right diversity of minerals that are bioavailable in your soil, this is why it takes a couple of years to remediate the soil. Because Roundup, you have to understand, Roundup has a half-life of 21 years. People don't always understand it. They read the box. It says, well, that's inert in 20 minutes. Oh, well, we forgot to tell you, that's only in distilled water. Show me in nature where you got distilled water. It doesn't work that way. So if this stuff has a residue, and some, some places it might be less, some places it's more. I mean, when I go do house calls to the Amish and they're buying a field from a conventional farmer, the seagulls are lined up out there as the horse goes by, there is nothing in the soil. And then after two years, once they get all the manure from the organic cows, get it back out there, you can take a shovel out there and you can find worms all over the place. It takes a while to bring the soil back if you give it a chance, that he, uh, this one house call, of course, when you're doing house calls to the Amish in the spring, I'm virtually taking my table out into the middle of the field, opening it up. And the guy says, you see those corn stalks there? He goes, yeah. 
he had corn here five years ago. I'm looking at corn. There's no degradation. He goes, yeah. See all the birds over there? There's not one bird in the field because there's nothing for the seagulls to eat. There is no life. And how can you create life from no life? I mean, this is going back to the Stone Age where they called spontaneous combustion because flies came out of, out of poop. <laughs> so well, that's uh, how I, you've got to have the right minerals in the soil. And you've got to be able to create diversity of bacteria. Now, the key minerals in the soil, it's like boron. Boron causes the hairs to grow better. But boron's got that slippery curve. A little bit's better, a little bit better, and all of a sudden it drops right off. Boron is the brakes. So too little, there's a problem, and too much is a problem. Luckily, at least boron will just evaporate or run off, and you'll get back to your optimal levels over time. Where other minerals, you pour it on, they're going to sit there forever. And that's like being a moron farmer. Quit pouring more on. Do a soil test. Find out what minerals are in balance. Maybe you got to bring the potassium up. Maybe you got to bring up the sulfur. You just got to gotta do your soil test to be intelligent about what you're going to grow. And then you put it on there. And of course, you, gotta, of course, you have to have good water, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Well, uh, let uh, let the listeners know how they can learn more about you and access some of your work. Well, um, I've been in Hillman, Michigan for 44 years. Um, I got a health food store, HillmanHealthFoodStore.com. Uh, if you ever want to reach me through that, send my store a message. I'll be more than happy to respond. Um, I do air mineral testing on a lot of people. Um, I do some stool testing. If the minerals are messed up, I don't even know to prove to them that the gut's messed up. Um, so I, I'm really big into that. Uh, if you put Richard Olery, my last name is spelled O-L-R-E-E, -E, into YouTube. Um, you put anything else, it doesn't show up. But if you put that in, there's a lot of stuff I've done. I, I've done a lot of lecturing for Organic Valley. At one time, I owned a company. I still own it. It's called the A1A2 Gene Testing Company, where we were trying to get the morphine out of the milk chain with Organic Valley. And I think for most part, that's probably the, the safest morphine-free milk in the, in the world. Um, that's the best way to do it. I mean, if you want an individual counsel, I'll be more than happy to give my office number and you can talk to Melissa. And I do half hour and hour consults, you know, based on hair tissue mineral analysis. Uh, that telephone number is 989-742-4242. Wonderful. We'll make sure that's in the show notes for people so they don't have to remember it. Yep. Uh, thank you, Rich, so much for your time. Thank you. A pleasure. It's been a pleasure meeting you. We'll pick it up again another day.